And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two of my good brothers. We have the 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 man of the most heretical ta heretical takes on Mecca. Not really. In fact, it's, in fact, it's rather loose. And the man who keeps abusing stim packs in Titanfall. Good, good brother Hi. Ash. Nice to meet you. And we have we have the man of a thousand runes and the. <laughs> CEO of Zadari Enterprises, good brother Xanatrix. Because remember, folks, Zadari Gar Zadari Enterprises guarantees that they will bring you up to ten thousand percent. Always, we're ever go we're always and forever going to outdo that asshole Amatsu guy. Mm -hmm. So. It is once again time to enter the Valley of the Judge, and this is the first of what I'm hoping to be a weekly series. Since oh, about a uh, in early 2020, EN Publishing announced that they were going to be doing a advanced 5th edition expansion called Level Up 5e, with that being the working title, with plans for it to go into Kickstarter in 2021. And in the process of doing that, they put they were they have been putting out a series of playtest documents. In fact, they just put they just put up a new one a few days ago. Now, one one might ask why why do why go through it in this form instead of going through it in their surveys? Well, for one, the surveys were timed, and they want and for me, it's a case of I need time to actually gather my thoughts instead of getting giving someone my immediate takes because let's be honest how how often have we had it where our immediate take differs significantly from our thoughts after we had some time and distance that's true although never for me but i understand it happening to anybody else bullshit i'm going to call bullshit because all of us are fucking human and thus all of us are uh are apt to err But that br that brings uh, that brings us to the first one that they're do that that they're doing called Origins, specifically their Origin system, which seems to fo seems to focus primarily on on their on heritage. We'll get we'll get to that in a minute and background. Now, obviously, we're not going to have the same level of detail as we did last time we did Valley of the Judge, simply because this is a 76-page document. But we, but we can skim through it and give our give our thoughts give our thoughts as we go. So hopefully, you hopefully both of you have the PDF in front of you. Hi. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's get things started. Now, they start. They open up with the whole what it is, what it isn't, what they're using it for, and so on, and a um, a outline on how it's going to go. So it looks like we have three pillars: heritage, culture, and background. Um, with heritage giving heritage trait, size, speed, and age. One heritage gift, culture. Self-explanatory and cultural traits, and then background, applying ability score bonuses, noting background proficiencies, languages, and feature, and roller choose connections and, and memento. This is an interest. They have an interesting little um, switching going on because the it's the background where a ab where ability scores are modified instead of through heritage less ancestry or, or whatever we, or whatever we're calling it this week to stay ahead of the law. <laughs> because remember, people, Watsi doesn't believe in race anymore. Yeah, you know what? Fuck it. We may as we may as well get we may as well dig we may as well dig that up since since they made such a huge deal out of it. It was the focal point 
with their last let's throw everything into an expansion book project. I think it was the cauldron of everything. Yes, the the kitchen sink book that I think is horribly horribly designed. Well, I I've made no bones about the fact that I don't care for this whole kitchen sink approach of just throw just throw a bunch of things that were previously posted in um, Unearthed Arcana into a book. Yep. Um, Ash, what what's been what's been your perspective on that on that particular approach? What with what with um, well now with the cal cauldron and and previously with Xanthar's guide to everything. Uh, my perspective is pretty similar to the Angry GMs, insofar as it's largely a collection of whatever they had on their desk at the time. And given that the classes and mechanics of base 5th edition, and we're going to be making a comparison to them, I assume, in this series, uh, are, are quite restrictive insofar as what new content can be produced for them, it actually prevents a lot of material go from going from the desk to the book. So a lot of extraneous material, things that might go in a DMG2 or something of that sort, also get mixed in with the Player's Handbook 2. Call me old-fashioned, but I'd rather have those, I'd rather have those um, separated. Plus, mm -hmm. um, because... I don't think you're going to get many arguments there. No. Um course if i wanted to be real cynical i'd 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 suspect that that um doing it in this in this manner is is a um is a way for is a way for them to push people into getting a beyond subscription which i'm not um i have five i have five e tools which works like beyond ex except it does everything better um but we'll start but when it comes to the whole changing from changing from race to um, her to heritage, I personally always looked at that at that little name change as um, if if you wanted if you want to do the name change, fine. But there's but one I'm not entirely sure if anybody at Wantsy thought through the app implications, although. Given what we said said during the reconstruction stream, I think it's pretty clear that there's a lot of people at Watsi who weren't thinking more than one step ahead. People in Watsi think. Ah. But there's also there's also the fact that I end I end up I found myself making the exact same statement that I made at one point when um when somebody when somebody decided to do the whole oh wrestling's fake thing around me i said i'm not anno i'm not annoyed that you said it i'm annoyed that you thought that you did some that you said something unique or revolutionary mm. and when it comes to that whole name change thing i'm more an i'm more annoyed that they pl that they plastered it about as if it's something that i should be celebrating when it's when it's just a giant ball of meh. Also, a uh, quick correction for you, Monk. Uh, the official Watsi term for race was changed to lineage. Heritage is the take that uh, Ian World is having. Yeah, and um, to be to be honest, I'm not in, I'm not entirely a, I'm not entirely a fan of each because it it's still lipstick on a pig. Yeah, it's uh, a point I was making before we we started. Uh, there's a word that while doesn't just say, yeah, this is race, still implies that it's connected to a specific genetic descent ancestry. Mm -hmm. That would be a better word than either lineage or heritage, especially considering that lineage is usually a very specific bloodline or clan when you think about it. If I, I, had, I had made it clear that when it comes to something like lineage... I would be more accepting of a term like that being used if I was if I was running, say, um, Birthright or Legend or Legend of the Five Rings or some sort, even even um, Succession Wars era BattleTech for that matter. You know, something where um, lit wars lineage and where and where your family comes from actually plays that much of a factor. 
Yeah. Hmm. You know, um, like I wouldn't be, I um, I wouldn't be opposed to say, astonishing swordsmen and sorcerers of Hyperborea used it because you're pl you're always playing as a human in that game. It's just a matter of what part, what part of the ancient world did you come from? Makes sense. Um. In any case, they should have stuck with the heritage thing because it was a perfectly acceptable uh, new nomenclature. Mm -hmm. so it, it's not for the... They're not doing it to... I don't think anybody at Watsi really thinks that the term race is an issue, except insofar as there are insane people who believe an immortal elf is of the which does not sleep is of the same mindset and biological characteristics as a humanoid creature which resembles a cheetah a walking cheetah you mean the tabaxi <laughs> yes so, uh, so it's not that it's it's just an avoidance of unnecessary uh social issues which i'm i'm not going to I'm not going to slam them for that in the slightest. I have plenty of other things to yell at them for. Yeah. Yes, there are other things to uh to to definitely slam Watsi for. Mm -hmm. Though I I I hesitate to say it this way, fallacy of relative privation. Um <laughs> but lineage would would work better just just thinking of lineage versus race in that respect. Lineage would work better for the different types of tabaxi there are. Panther tabaxi, cheetah tabaxi, lion tabaxi. Those are each a tabaxi lineage or a tabaxi heritage yeah. because they're all within the same ancestry. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> we, we open with, the whole, with a, a paragraph on origin, which talks about splitting the origin into three parts, heritage, culture, and background. Then building the origin story, which um, is something that I will admit I'm skip I'm skimming through simply because of the fact that I see a lot of these whole building your origin story re remarks in all manner of different games, and I'll I'll be honest, a lot of G a lot of GM or a lot of the these sort of bringing your character to life advice sections, um, I find myself tuning out not because not because it's poorly written or anything like that, but simply because it's treading on ground that I've seen way too many times for me to count. I tune out because uh, I recognize that from a very fundamental area, building a, an origin story or a backstory is an extremely subjective matter. Yeah. So whatever they prescribe may not fit for whomever is reading. It's one of those things that obviously it needs to be there, but it's, but I, but, um, I don't need to put as mu I don't need to put as much thought into into that section. Anyway, yeah. So they first go into heritage, going with going with um, the biologically inherited traits as well as details about appearance. Um, a bit of nurture and a bit of nurture and nature. Um, and then saying an adventurer should not be limited by your heritage by their heritage and going into a sidebar about mixed heritages. Let's see, and it grants age, size, speed, heritage gift, and a paragon gift at tenth level. Alright, that's new. Are we actually have are we actually having are we actually having heritage matter beyond first level for once? <laughs> um I mean if it does, this is only going to happen in either games that already start at, at the middle levels or at characters that carry through multiple different modules or campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, you don't normally see characters starting at level 1 really make it to 10th level these days. Usually they get around 5th to 7th and then new campaign, new characters, new level 1s. But this is a playtest for what would fundamentally be a different game. I could see myself doing a up to level ten in a in a in a rule system which uses setup, mm -hmm. largely because it does actually give you things, increased an increased number of things that you're going to acquire, 
mm-hmm. across the course of that uh, character's life. Yeah. If I were going to be playtesting this, uh, I think I would probably start my characters out or my players out around level seven so that they can get stu- uh, uh, a feel of what the characters would be like without the Paragon gift. And then when we get to the Paragon gift, they inherit that and see how everything happens afterwards. Yeah. Uh, because I imagine that these playtest documents are meant for some pretty we're meant for some pretty quick uh, pretty quick assessments comparatively, like a few months rather than a few years. Yeah. So let's see, then the second step they talk about is culture. For each heritage option, there are multiple cultural options. You can you choose one culture to gain traits from. Um, then it also brings brings up languages. Um, I'm hold I'm holding off what I have to say about that until until we until we see examples. Then the final step is background, which go which goes into goes into mechanical benefits and role play oriented benefits. Each background increases at least one of a, a character's ability scores by one point. Um, so there's no negatives to having a background. You know. I do fi- I do find it funny that there that there is that whole spiel about um about remove about removing negatives and I once again I said am I supposed to be giving you a cookie because um I'm all I'm all out of cookies because you know it's not like um it's not like an it's not like a certain other edition that everybody besmirches but he, but us in the temple did this uh, did this oh, over a decade ago. <laughs> Or it's not like a certain old TG meme about Neg Four Strength. The Neg Four Strength thing that go that goes that goes back to eight to eight. In, I know, in I know. Um, <laughs> but the, but, and I'd actually argue that when they got rid of the when they got rid of the negatives in fourth edition, they had a better reason. And I do, I do remember the explanation that was given because I was, I was watching the updates weekly. The reasoning that they gave back in 2008 was it was becoming harder and harder to justify the plus two, minus two dichotomy that they had gotten themselves in with third edition. And, and how you could circumvent it by making your uh, character a half human with any other race. Well, one of the, one of the things that was cited was the was was the um my, was the minus two charisma that Warforged got. Where I understand why the Warforged, when initially designed, had a neg two charisma. It, it's pretty alien to see a construct that can think for itself in a world where most constructs are used to try and kill you. Well. Here's here's the reason why I have a problem with that, and this is a common mistake I see people make. Charisma is not is not phys, is not just physical appearance. I yes. see that people that's one of the rook that's one of the big rookie mistakes. That's very true. Charisma is a combination of multiple factors having to do with the ca- with the character and how they interact mm-hmm. with people in general. The and, the ori- one of the or one of the early version one of the early versions of um can't rem- can't remember if it was the if it was Beckme or if it was BX that did this but I remember an early version of first edition that you that used Napoleon Bonaparte as an as an example of people who were very charismatic but weren't exa- but weren't exactly um the prettiest to look at you know I love how people still make short jokes about Napoleon, not realizing that the only reason people portrayed him as short is because he surrounded himself with his tallest men so snipers could not kill him. He was actually pretty average for that for that uh, that era of Europe. Mm-hmm. No, but yes, a, a, a force of personality can overcome any, m- most physical um deficits to your charisma if your personality is is either intimidating enough or adroit enough to uh to 
move the scene, as it were, whether you're in a ballroom or on the battlefield. I don't think Uh, any of these designers would have disagreed with that. It's a simple fact that Warforged, for using this example, have an initial hampering factor in regards to whether or not their personality is enough to persuade somebody else. Which is, which is again, fine. It, the, the issue comes in when you've backed yourself into a design corner and you decide that you're just going to continually make use of, uh, you know, negatives for any given... Um, yeah. How would I put it? Yeah, it's, it's annoying. And 4th um, edition and 13th age had, have a, a workaround that I actually prefer. <clears throat> and... Um, I think Pathfinder 2nd Edition also does this. Your race and class allow for a plus two modifier in one, in one of two ability scores. The catch being you can't double down. So if your race give, gives you a potential plus two in strength, you can't take that and then, and then also take a fighter and give yourself another plus two. Makes sense. Um. Now, when it comes to um, prof- when it comes to proficiencies, since they're putting that they're putting that in, um, that's gonna be one of those. Ho- I'm gonna be that's gonna be one of the, one of those hold my judgment because um, I do sometimes feel that's that um, it's it's one of those no wins it's one of those no win scenarios because as I talked about when we did the um, when we did the reconstruction video. D and D's always felt awkward with a skill system. Yeah, because in in the end, D and D's focus really is mostly around combat. Mm-hmm. At least Watsy Watsy D and D certainly is. Um. Well, there, well, pre well pre that the closest the closest thing to a skill system was the proficiency thing in um, A D and D second. And that was um, as a non-weapon proficiencies. Yeah. They were called in the first edition of the game. Even even then, that whole thing was kind of undercooked. Right. Um. If you want to see old school actually use the whole non-weapon proficiencies right, um, I refer over to um, Axe. But let's see. So then we have um, options for connections, like one acquaintance, ally, or enemy that's had an effect. Um, equipment, suggested equipment sets, and and gold cost, self-explanatory. Memento. Um, there is something. Ki- there is something kind of like that in the way backgrounds are, work in core, but um. But it's but. I'm not. I'm, but um, I'm not going to give a huge pass because, <laughs> well, war, well, Dark Heresy also had it. Wait, Dark Heresy also had the had that whole thing. Um, and well, okay. me- mementos are not always necessary yeah. for a character either. And back and background features. So first we have the heritage and culture list. So we have, we've got it. We've got a decent set set for each, since each. Each her- each heritage on this list has four cultures they can pick from, and then there's a list of six general cultures. Mm-hmm. I would like to point out that there's this little offset about culture that is an expansion of, upon their initial statement about culture in the in the summary of the three pillars mm-hmm. uh, that says you can choose any culture for your character, even if it's not listed alongside your heritage. A dwarf can grow up in a wood elf culture. And a tiefling can hail from a cosmopolitan city. Well, while I can believe the tiefling hailing from a cosmopolitan city, I don't see any dwarf ever growing up in a forest with elves. That's one of those things of of them go, of them going. If you want, if you want to do it, if you want to do it, fine. But um, I feel like that should have an extra sentence of talk with your GM about it. Why? It may not fit the GM setting, mm-hmm. but here's the thing: it, what? And this is per, thank you for the lead up because it looks as if 
5e in this particular playtest was setting up to be a game. Not just the, oh, butcher this however you want. It can be anything, can be your game and stuff like that. Like, no, no, it, this is a game. It has an implied setting to it. And, you know, if we come out with other settings in the future, those will have modifiers on the rules we've set up beforehand. But this is an internally consistent game with its own assumptions and with its own declarations about how things function in the world. As opposed to, well, you have your own homebrew and you could do anything you want because you have homebrew. It's like, no, 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 no. We're making declarative statements about, yeah, this is how, this is how we assume things work in D&D. You draw your conclusions from the setting writ large from these rules that we're presenting to you as fact, mm -hmm. which I actually much prefer. And and I'm sort of sad to have seen this uh, to have seen this stuff go because insofar as because you know Five E was declared to be a more narrative focused game, and these options here, these discussions, the the what they're presenting in the playtest actually seem to go along with that and reinforce that your character has you know heritage, background, culture. You have a memento with you that says something about your character. And your character has memento with them because we're going to demand that you include something that says something about your character. These are actually perfectly serviceable. I might even dare to say good means of enforcing a more narrative game for people who come to the table. I will. I will admit. I will admit. I def. I um. I can definitely. I can definitely. I'm a little. I'm a little more willing to go to go along with this with the list that they have here versus vanilla um as for for me for me personally when it comes to some of those combinations it would be a, it would be a case of okay okay i'd um i'd i'd like you to make sure you're thinking about the implications first before you go with that um yeah which, that's the thing, is the GM has plenty of room to rule and be creative within the confines of these particular rules. Yeah. The dwarf that grows up in the elf, uh, enclave, whatever you would call it, is a slave. You want to have a dwarf character that grows up there? They're a slave. You could, you could perfectly rule that within the context of your world or whatever it might have, whatever your reasoning might happen to be. Which and if necessary, at some point in the future, like I mentioned earlier, you know, you come to Dark Sun or whatever, sorry, the tiefling doesn't grow up in the... I don't even know if uh, tieflings existed in Dark Sun, but sorry, the tiefling doesn't grow up in the halfling culture because the halflings would have eaten them in the context of Dark Sun. Um, and you could put exceptions for this in future supplements. I think for... So I think it's pretty well designed. I think for E Dark Sun, you could... Play, you could play as a tiefling, but um, you but um, probably probably best to keep those features covered as be as best you can. Especially if, especially if you're in, especially if you're in a sit, if you're in any major city, because the sorcerer kings might want might want to might have a few questions. <laughs> Either that, or right. they might jump to conclusions and try and have you killed. Um. Then we we do have the whole thing of mi of mixed heritage. Um. They start they start up with dra with dragonborn. Um. I do like that w we have a draconic ancestry table spe specific specifically for all the all the different types of breath weapons that we could potentially go with, and it's a lot bigger variety of of breath weapons. Than we see in core, because it goes beyond just the normal chromatic metallic split. We have gem and essence dragons as well. Mm -hmm. Which I'm, per I'm perfectly f I'm perfectly fine with. Although there's a small part of me that's trying to visualize how you would do psychic damage, as you as you would if you were if you had a um if you had a amethyst ancestry here. <laughs> You'd figure it out eventually, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but there's also the fact that, like in core, um, dragon breath is a cone. 
Whereas with some of these, you can do cone or line, which is interesting. Well, in core, there are lines. Dra in there core. are lines. Any of the lightning dragon types, the like the blues and and I believe it's the bronzes. Yeah, um, have Whoever always done that. As well, I believe that's black and yep. copper. Don't quote me on copper, but definitely black. Well, those are all on the table as well. So yes, black and copper, uh, blue and bronze in core do lines rather than cones. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. know they're just addicted to that cocaine. Oh, they've been hanging out with Dr. Roxo. Well, I mean, the blacks' brains are already melting on their own acid. And anyways, um... I'm happy to see the inclusion of of gems. Surprised to see the inclusion of essence. Though nope. pleasantly surprised. And some of these are quite exotic. Like, they included dragon turtles. I love that. Yep. And then, those um, who are really big fans of Gamera. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah. well, any eastern dragon types. Mm -hmm. um, I think my favorite thing to see here is an essence dragon uh, in river. Because it's lightning in a cone, rather than lightning in a line. Yeah, that was they. They seem to have taken full advantage of the mechanical variety they had access to. Yeah. Which now, is, as far as I'm concerned, skimming through this document, that's going to be the theme: is they were taking full advantage of the different options. I'm definitely going to rip some of this stuff off to the extent that it actually fits in Lord Sabracus and mm -hmm. what I can actually fit inside a card system. But moving on. Yeah. <laughs> then we also have a list of draconic gifts. And you can start out taking one of these, and that'll be one of your racial features. Um, and before anybody shouts at me about, about the fact that I'm using the term race, old habits die hard, motherfuckers. And also, we don't give a fuck. Yeah. Nobody's going to complain about it anyways. It's mostly just wasted breath. Yeah. So Draco we have draconian armor, where you, where you have resistance to your ancestry's damage type. Um when you're not wearing armor, you have you have AC plus Dex AC. S sorry, eight, thirteen plus Dex AC, um, and and claws that can be used to do slashing damage of one d four plus strength instead of the normal bludgeoning damage. Um, draconian fins, so which can give you a swimming speed of thirty feet, and be able to hold your breath up to fifteen minutes. Let's see, hard to hit. Gives you um, twelve plus dex as your AC, and can you and you can use a shield and still gain the benefit. Well, you can do that with draconic armor as well, and low light vision, self-explanatory, or draconian wings, which just which just get which is just going to give you flight. And flight you know, equal to your, it looks like it's flight equal to your run your uh, normal run speed because I'm pretty sure base for Dragonborn is 30 feet with uh, there. Well, there's also an interesting note for for a restriction on fly speed. Light Beyond armor only. Medium or heavy armor it says when you spend three full consecutive rounds airborne without landing, you gain you a level, level of exhaustion. These levels of exhaustion are removed upon finishing a shorter long rest. Well, and that. I think that actually makes a lot of sense. Flight for someone who is not exactly built for the same type of flight as a full dragon would be mm -hmm. would tire them out. It's a constant use of those muscles. Let's it certainly could. That, um, it's a very useful game design. Uh, let's very not, useful let's, facet of game design. Let's not forget that Dragonborn aren't exactly lightweights, even the skinny ones. Like it talks about size. <laughs> Like, look, look at where it says for size. They stand at over six feet tall and weigh between 250 and 300 pounds. Right. Well, these are also magical creatures. We're not evaluating on the basis of yep. realism. Otherwise, any dragonborn with a... Um, <laughs> any, any dragonborn with wings would need pectorals the size of their quads in order to actually lift off. Well, may maybe that's why they're two to three hundred pounds. They do have pectorals the size of their oh, body. <laughs> I hadn't considered that. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> but no, the, ma the magic lizard people do not need to have a musculature that looks cartoonish. Yeah. Um, then we then the paragon. We already talked about the whole paragon thing, and it looks like the choice 
the the choices that we have here are based on the um, based on the types with with chromatic, metallic, gem, and essence. And let's see, chrom chromatic. Any creature that hits you with a melee attack within five feet takes one d6 damage of your ancestry's type. Metallic. Whenever you make an intelligence check, you can roll an additional d6. Gem. Whenever you make a charisma check, you can roll an additional d6. And essence. Whenever you finish a short rest, you can heal an additional d6 for each hit die spent. So two of those are extremely useful. A metallic paragon would be great for wizards. And a gem paragon would be great for, well, any charisma caster. Source aladins. <laughs> Powlerers. I'm going to say it for the rest of my days. <laughs> but uh, the other two, the Chromatic Paragon and the Essence Paragon, at 10th level, those are actually fairly underpowered. Um, it, any creature within you know normal reach, only taking 1d6 of damage of the type associated with your ancestry, at level 10, that's that's negligible with most uh, threats that a, a normal uh, level 10 four-person party would be. Would you bump that to D8? Yeah, I think a D8 would be a little more reasonable, especially because... It's the not that, that underpowered if an average difference of one damage is what makes the difference for you. But at 10th level, that's an average difference of one damage is usually not the case. Um, no, what you said was, the, the question was, would you bump it up to a D8? You said that would be more reasonable. So that's a different That's a, a difference of, on average, of one damage. Well, I, I, just, po I just posited D8 as, as, a, a spit, as a spitball number. No, 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 I, I know, I'm just going I, off the basis I think of the I, I think I would. I think I would go two dice, though, instead. Rather two than dice just is one. reasonable. It, depending on the uh, depending on all the other stuff, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's two d six. The would point probably... being is, at tenth level, you could take a lot more hits. Mm -hmm. Granted, some creatures that are going to be facing at that level are going to be destructive enough so that if they do hit you that close, it's going to be it's going to be pretty brutal. Yeah, but at tenth and... level, five e was designed with in mind large numbers of enemies that were going to be crowding around you. So this actually. Adds up across the course of the battle, I believe. Pain in the ass to track, and I don't include these features in my own uh, games as a result of that, but on a pure mathematical basis, it does actually add up over time. It does. I just think that at 10th level, because of the the way those threats could be, as you, as you pointed out, uh, 5e does normally have the idea of swarms rather than one large heavy hitter or two well, large heavy hitters. swarms. I'm just yes. saying this is internally consistent. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think bumping it up another die rather than bumping it up another uh, face would be more reasonable. So 2d6 damage of, you know, oh, you're you're a blue dragonborn, someone hits you. Uh, 2d6 lightning damage to that person who hits you. That could make a load of difference, especially if... Um, if they're particularly weak to that elemental damage, uh, and then or at the very the, least not resistant to it, that too, yeah. With the essence paragon, I can see that going well for everyone but the fighter and the barbarian. Uh, an additional d6 for a short rest, uh, where you can spend hit dice to to, re to rest up and get some HP back. Um, it's an additional hit. It's an additional d6 for each hit die spent. Yeah, this is. Oh, okay. I, I misread. Bad. I misread that. Yeah. Okay. Now, extraordinarily useful. You're effectively adding either another hit dice or another half of the hit dice. Mm -hmm. Yes. We'll say another, we'll say another half a hit dice for yeah. each one that you spend. I, if you're typically spending four, you basically just got an additional two. Mm-hmm. And if it's for certain classes that only have a D6 or D4 for health... Then it's you're... even superior. Mm -hmm. It's superior. I mis I misread. That's my fault. I do acknowledge that. And 
Let's see, then when it comes to culture, the first one they talk about is dra is Dragon Bond is um Dragon Bond, where you're still under the direct rule of your progenitor dragon, um, and the clan exists to serve it. So on one on one hand, that could be under a chromatic, where life is, where life is short and Sith happens, or under a metallic, where the where the dragon is prob where the, the dragon probably treats you. <laughs> As as a little kid, no matter how old you are, um, let's see. It start. You get one cantrip from the wizard or cleric spell lists, and your spell casting ability is either intelligence or wisdom, your choice. For that specific cantrip, yeah. Um, let's see. You have it. You have advantage on charisma checks made to influence creatures with the dragon type. Okay. Um, dragon. That just means other dragonborn and other dragons. <clears throat> yeah. And, well, and ha any anything can, that's technically a half dragon template. And one and one final one based on the based on the type of um, category that you have. Let's see chromatic you can cast fear you can cast fear once and re once per long rest using charisma um let's see metallic you choose between arcana history medicine nature or religion and gain proficiency with it your profit and your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check that that you make that uses that skill um, I could see that getting really ridiculous at high levels. Oh yeah. Um, let's see, gem gem dragon. You know the message cantrip. At third level, you can cast illusory script. One um once per once long per... once per long rest. At fifth level, you can cast knock. Once per long rest. And using intelligence or charisma. Um. And essence, essence dragons. You know the druidcraft cantrip, and you have advantage on all charisma ch checks made to influence creatures with the beast or celestial creature types. I feel like I feel like the progenitor's boon. I feel like some. I feel like some of them are more useful than others. I mean, Gem. There, was a, there was a bit of dis there was a bit of this disparity with draconic paragon, but I think it's a little more pronounced here. Like uh -huh. gem, <laughs> gem, um, gem. I feel like gem is a little bit un is a little bit underpowered compared to the others. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. The knock spell can be actually pretty useful. As is the message cantrip. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Which is why I think it's it's by and large fine, adjusting for any kind of imbalances that you might have. When choosing, when first choosing your draconic ancestry, yeah, that's going to have an impact on your overall I, I, power level to begin with. And I think that these are these are relatively balanced insofar as the more attractive, depending on who it, who you are and what kind of character you're thinking of playing. Um, I, just, I could I see just... some people cry foul about about um, the metallic boon. Why? Yeah. Choose whole... a skill from among arcana, history, medicine, nature, religion. Proficiency, and you get to double your proficiency bonus for it. It's, if somebody wants a skill monkey, that's that's perfectly fine. Want to do the metallic dragon bard? It's the whole proficiency bonus is doubled because that's not a feature that I see all that often. Is that a like, bad thing? Not necessarily. Um, I think my favorite among the four, though, just for theming purposes, is um chromatic because it's just like oh yeah you're a you, you're pro, your progenitor's boon from be, from being controlled by a cr chromatic is you have dragon fear go for it i i will i will however note that the way this is the way this kind of thing is set up i could see a i could see a potential mad issue develop Mad be mad being multiple ability dependency for those unaware. Um, I think it. I think the. I think the issue that I that I have is, is um the fact that, 
I would I would rather something like this pick pick one a pick one ability for one ability modifier for the for spells and stick and stick with that instead of split instead of splitting it two ways. But that would enforce the mad problem that you were talking about earlier. Some of these guys are going to want to be, you know, dragon bound wizards. And if they see that and they see that, okay, cool, I can use with the gem dragon, I can use intelligence for my modifier, as opposed to charisma, which doesn't even matter all that much for them, frankly, because several of these, you don't actually need to make any rolls, you don't need to make any saving throws that are reliant on your spellcasting ability modifier. So it's pretty... Hmm. Um, mm. Let's see. The next, next heritage. Next, um, not heritage, but culture is draconic national. Um. I e I e a drac I e a draconic nation. <laughs> um. Which is de is definitely definitely a uh, interest a interesting um prospect. Um. Certainly, breaking it's, away from the from the way from the way draconic culture is typically depicted in in fantasy fiction. Yeah, they they build nations because their progenitor died. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So they they end up gaining pack um, pack tactics. So you have advantage on attack rolls against a creature if at least one allied dragonborn was is within five feet of the creature and the ally is inca incapacitated. Um, let's see, then the business of dragons, you have proficiency in, prof in persuasion and one tool of your choice. I feel like the nationals would be, would lean a bit more in the skill monkey end of things. Um, I do think, I, um, if some, if there would, national is, is one instance where I'd, um, I'd be a little hesitant to ha to have somebody play a dr play a draconic national if they're the only dragonborn in in the um in the party because they lose out on pack tactics. Yeah, but I I don't think pack tactics would necessarily be the deciding factor for a, a national. It'd be pretty. It's a pretty hefty feature. mm Hmm. If you really want, uh, if you really want additional skills and stuff like that, you could always go with Dragon Bound. So I feel like this is actually simply setting up, like, hey, if you want to be a Dragonborn with somebody else in your party, this is where you go for it. Or Which I'd actually, I'd actually be appreciative of that since you guys have probably seen this as well as I have. There seems to be, there seems to be this um in this inborn attitude that nobody should be no. No, there shouldn't be more than one person playing one race. I actually haven't seen that. I have. I've it's... seen the prevalence of it in other in other groups. Mm -hmm. I never encourage or even make mention of something like that. I just tell people people definitely do, do naturally tend towards party of freaks. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's that's certainly a natural thing. I haven't seen anybody affirm that party but of I've freaks gotten... must be instantiated. Some sometimes depending on the type of <clears throat> usually it just depends on my player base, but most but I usually tend to get players who are either a party of completely disparate freaks, and it's not even it's just natural that way. Or I once had a party of freaks that turned out to be just three it was three warforged, a tiefling, and a half knoll. In any case, what were you saying about the um, about appreciating it? Um, this it's something like this can give a can give a bit more of an incentive to have people have people um play more play um more than one of more than one of the same same race because like I said I've um it's not something that I encourage but I do I do see people um be a little bit hesitant. And ironically, I see I see those I see those same folk um, cry foul when I say 
Guys, this is a this is a human only campaign. Which I've seen whenever I've run a sword and sorcery game, and then somebody's like, "But we're, you're using fantasy. Why aren't you using fantasy races?" Um, because because you guys are in Hyperborea, and <laughs> and, and when's the la when's the last time an elf showed up in Hyperborea? <laughs> uh... Now, if you now if you want to be if you if you want to be if you want to be a, if you want to be a sti a Stygian and who 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 everybody thinks has pointed ears okay fine um that might be stretching things a little bit but okay um but then we have the dragon cultist and i don't know why but i i hear the ter i hear the name dragon cultist and i immediately think of orphan <laughs> when i when i hear dragon cultist the first thing i th i think is uh eh. Is um, slayers, but only because you know the, the name of the spell is dragon slave. Mm -hmm. um, I will. I will. In my defense, it wasn't too long ago that I watched the first season of the Orphan remake, and um, it's pretty damn good. Um, but the but the traits that they have are first we have draconic umbra, which let's see. is. Is it's an umbra based on your type? Mm -hmm. They just accidentally bolded the chromatic dragon umbra yeah. uh, title. So let's see, chromatic. One once on each of your turns while it's active, you can do extra damage of the type associated with your ancestry to one target when you deal damage to it with an attack or spell. This extra damage equals your level. Okay. Um, metallic. You get resistance to that to that type. If you already had resistance, you gain immunity instead, and you have advantage on wisdom or intelligence checks you make while active. Gem, you have advantage on all stealth checks. Once once on each of your turns while this is active, you can cast detect thoughts at will. When it at when it ends, so do any active spells cast with it. Um, <laughs> I could see that getting abused. Mm-hmm. Um, gem dragon uh, cultists are going to be your rogues. Yep. Um, essence dra essence dragon. When a when active, you can move through non magical solid objects and occupied spaces as if they were diff as as if they were difficult terrain. Any AOOs made against you while this is active are made at disadvantage. You can't move further than five feet into walls or other solid objects, so no night, no um, no vision for you. <laughs> if, if for whatever reason you would end your turn in an occupied space, you are shunted into the nearest unoccupied space, randomly selected, and take one d6 force damage. And you can't use this trait again until you finish a long rest. So and your draconic umbra is once per long rest. Mm -hmm. Oh. And much as I hate once per long rest features, this seems by and large pretty designed to be fun at the very mm -hmm. least. And at at the very at the very least, like I know I joked about the gem gem dragon number of getting getting abused, but um, I think all I think all of these could be re could be um abused in at least fun ways, since they since they're set they're um. They're, they're set. They're set up to be able to do to be able to do multiple things, and it's to, and even though it's only gonna last a minute, a minute in a minute in combat time is still it's that's like ten turns. But the combat only lasts like three minutes, so it's like or three rounds, mm -hmm. not three minutes. Yeah. So yeah, if you're, if you're doing this, I mean, if you're activating these in combat. Um, I don't think that the gem dragon really would activate this in combat. Probably, they might use it for some other purpose. Mm -hmm. But you never know. Yeah. Um, let's see. And choose two skills from Arcana, Deception, Persuasion, Religion, or Stealth, and you gain proficiency with both. Let's see. And then we have the last one that we have for for Dragonborn is Exiles. And let's see. They have chased by dragons. 
You gain a plus five bonus to initiative and can't be su and can't be surprised while conscious. I'll always re I'll always remember the c the scene in Darkness Rising where where the monk is like, "Who the hell picks improved initiative?" <coughs> well, I I would mostly because initiative rules back then sucked. Yeah. Oh, let's see hidden scales. You're proficient with the deception skill and with disguise kits. <laughs> the, the idea of a of a big of a big six foot tall dragonborn having to having to wear disguise makeup is very very amusing to me. Yeah, especially since most uh, dragonborn tend to have snoutish faces. Yeah. Um. They'd have to re uh, redisguise as some other monstrous humanoid. Mm -hmm. And survivor, you're proficient in the survival skill. You can, you um, can sub you can subsist on as little as a quarter of a pound of food a day. Which, um, given the size of dragons, the abil something of that size to be able to subsist on that little food is certain. magical. <laughs> Magical, but I can but allow me to laugh at the implications. And then we get to then we get to the dwarves. I like dwarves. I like dwarves because they they're the only race that hell that hate elves more than me. And the and and well, the whole thing with the beards and the hammers. I'm just a a giant dwarf. <laughs> um. Let's see, then we have the kind of traits that one would expect. They have dark vision. They have the they have proficiency with a set of artisan's tools. During a long rest, you can use these tools for crafting and still receive the full benefits of resting. So we have dwarves that are workaholics too. Let's see, dwarf gifts. So we the gifts that we have are Dwarven Stability, advantage on saving throws that would knock you prone, and on Strength Athletics Chest to resist shove. Dwarven Stubbornness, gain a number of temp hit points equal to D10 plus your levels. So they basically they basically can get Second Wind as a racial trait. So that's basically what that is. No. Yeah. yeah, it is. I like it. Let's see, gift, gifted art, gifted artisan, double proficiency to artisan to creator's blessing artisan tool checks. Yep, iron guts, advantage against poison, advantage on saving throws against poison and resistance against poison damage. Pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that's there for those who want who want the ale. Dwarven ale? You mean the thing I used to degrease my axles on my horse cart carriage? <laughs> Oh, stone fists, unarmed strikes deal 1d4 plus strength modifier bludgeoning damage. So they get the improved unarmed strike feat mm -hmm. for free as a, as a racial bonus. Yep. Um, let's see. Then for a par they only have two paragon gifts. The first is Fury of the Earth. Where the ground in a 30-foot burst centered on you becomes difficult terrain. Each creature on the ground in the area must make a dex save or get knocked prone. If any of them are concentrating, they must make a constitution saving throw. On a failed save, their concentration is broken. Have we not made it... Did we not make it clear um, last time we did this that we absolutely despise the concentration rules as they are? Especially for yeah. spellcasters? Yep. But yeah. I don't see it's, it's not particularly relevant here, but hey, that'll be... Whichever way concentration works, uh, this, would be, this would be a cool feature to have as a player character. Yeah. Um, and and this is this is basically just um, any of the earth moves anybody has ever seen in video games or TV or, or anything like that, where they hit the ground and everything gets turned into fractured rock. Yeah. <clears throat> or for or for the or for those less cultured superhero landing. That too. <laughs> Let's see, and unbreakable. You can expend one hit die to recover one hit point as a. What, sorry, when you succeed at a death saving throw, you can expend one hit die to recover one hit point, as if you're 
check result was a natural 20. Can't so basically, they, on a successful de death saving throw, they, they can spend a hit die to immediately stabilize. Mm -hmm. Fun, fun. Yep. Let's see, then we have cultures. First is deep dwarves. So tip, so our typical dwarf. Um, maybe it may or may not be singing Diggy Diggy Hole. No, but they will tell you in a, in a dreadful Scottish accent to get out of their home. <laughs> or wait, was that Shrek? <laughs> oh god! Ash, didn't some didn't somebody bring up a didn't somebody bring up a Shrek VHS on your server today? Yes, I did. <laughs> Shrek is just a giant green dwarf living in a swamp. Prove me wrong. The only thing he doesn't have is I was going to say the only thing he doesn't have is the beard, but doesn't he get it in later movies? I don't know. <laughs> in a while. Um. See, so, see, superior dark vision. Your dark vision has a radius of 120 feet instead of the usual 30. See, deep magic. When you reach third level, you can cast jump. When you reach fifth level, you can cast enlarge slash reduce. You don't need material components for either spell, and you can't cast them while you're in direct sunlight, although sunlight has no effect on them once cast. And you get the resistance cantrip. Yep. Intelligence is the spell casting ability. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is what Gimli wished he had had so that he didn't have to be tossed. <laughs> it's a pretty cool iteration of Durgar, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Um, let's see, deep suspicion. You have advantage on saving throws against illusions and being charmed or paralyzed. Let's see, underground combat training. You're proficient with hand crossbows, short swords, and war picks. Hey, not bad. Um, if there's anything I can see getting abused in this, it's um, it's the enlarge reduce spell <laughs> that you get at fifth level. Reduce, always reduce. Get as tiny as a mouse. <laughs> I get. I could. I could see. I could see some, but I could. I could see somebody abuse specific. Especially somebody who leans a bit more martial, you having some fun with enlarge. Yeah. Um, may or it's may pretty effective spell. May or may not use the um, the super mushroom sound effect from Mario Brothers in the process. I don't know. That's what I would do. Of course you would. Let's see. And we have devoted dwarf for those who follow the those who are the more religious ones, the more um, I was gonna say Bible thumping, but 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 it would but that would be cast in stone. So what would I use? What would I call it instead? Bible thumping. There's nothing wrong with the Bible we cast in stone. Mm -hmm. um, Talking about their bi their Bible is a hammer. It's still just Bible thumping. <laughs> so, they just get to say that all of their attacks with their hammer is Bible thumping. You see, de de devoted dwarfs are clearly an evangelistic uh, religion, and much like the uh, the uh, Church of of Trepani from Transmetropolitan, since they're evangelistic, they get to hit you with their hammer as an act of devotion. <laughs> And somehow that's still better than the Hammerites and Thief. <laughs> Although at the very least they're more dignified than Karis. <laughs> oh, so let's see. So they start. They start with the. They know the guidance cantrip, as one, one would expect. Expect. They can learn bless at third level. And aid at fifth level. Once again, you don't need material components, and you regain these spells after a long rest. Wisdom is your spellcasting ability. As expected, they're proficient in religion. Mm -hmm. They have and have advantage in wisdom and charisma saving throws against spells. Whenever the target of a guidance spell you cast makes an ability check to use a tool you're proficient with, you can help them as a bonus action. Um, I like this, but I feel I feel like this I feel like um. This is kind of signposting what class you should be you should be picking when you'd go with this. <laughs> now, just some just some subtle hints here and there. 
Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So, as expected of deep dwarves, they they spoke common under common in dwarven. Yep. Um, these devoted dwarves speak common dwarven in celestial. Which does lead does me lead lead me to want to one particular question for you guys. Hmm. In the the way you the way you'd particularly set it up, would you consider monks a divine class or a martial class? Hybrid. Uh, and it also depends on the type of monastery, but with the way that they're presented as a, as a class at base, it's a hybrid. In what like in what game? Just in just in uh, gen just in general, because ob obviously obviously You're not hit me with just in general because I play many different games with many different monks. <laughs> You're <laughs> torturing me. First time? <laughs> yes. That's that's why I said depending on the game it could change, but as presented in fifth, they're a hybrid class because they're they're clearly religious, but they're also clearly militant. Yeah. Um, so in, in the context of what we are reviewing, they're a hybrid class. Yeah. Um, now, you know, my opinions on that already is I view them as being the default psionic class. <laughs> well, um, funny you should mention that because that's exactly what they were in fourth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's see. Mountain dwarf, and I do I do like that they didn't need, that they dropped the pretense by saying when most people think of dwarves, they think of mountain dwarves. Um, and can and consider them t and saying this is a stereotype that is sometimes misapplied to other dwarven cultures, which is doubly sad because some mountain dwarves consider themselves to be more dwarf than all others, which is fair is fairly accurate. Um, yeah, it's... but most dwarves also wouldn't give a shit about stereotypes and just tell you to, to fuck off with that a is... hammer. That is, why <laughs> I like... that is why I like dwarves. Dwarves can be assholes, but at least the... at least they're not going to be um, subtle about it. Just remember, one of my favorite drawings from TG is uh, is when they made Super Robot Wars insert panels of specific TG stereotypes and the one for a dwarf was literally just a shin getter one <laughs> using the giant shin getter tomahawk and the dwarf in the cut in the inset cut says uh ancient dwarf technique deforestation <laughs> anyway so we with mountain dwarves we start with weapon training they have proficiency with the battle axe hand axe light hammer and warhammer about what you'd expect um Armor training, tra proficient in light and medium armor. Stone cunning. When you make a history check related to the origin of stonework, you're considered proficient in the history skill and double your proficiency bonus. Let's see. Heart of the Forge, you're resistant to fire damage. Mountain, bo mountain born, acclimated to high altitude, including elevations above 20,000 feet, and adapted to cold climates. Resistance to fire and adaptation to the cold? Huh. And they get common, dwarven, and just third language of your choice. Period. Let's see. Then we have Ruined Dwarf. Who I'd say that I'd say they'd probably be I'd say they'd probably be some, something like the um the dwarves, the, any the, dwarves that ex that escaped Moria. Yeah. Um. Let's see. So they start. They improvise tools. So if they have access to raw materials, they can jury rig an improvised toolkit. If you roll a one using the tools, they break. Um, roll with the punches. After you fail an ability check, you have advantage on your next ability check. I can. S you can't use this again after. Until after you finish a short or long rest. Okay. Eat like a bird. You can go without food for a number of days equal to 6 plus your con mod. You still suffer one level of exhaustion at the end of each day beyond this beyond this limit. If somebody's got a good con mod, then they could then... 
They could sur- they could survive for almost two weeks. Yep. Um, let's see, pack rat, you you count as one size larger when determining carrying capacity. I'm not that anal about carrying capacity, but okay. And base walking speed increases by five feet. So now they've got the same walking speed as everybody else. <laughs> Let's see. Um, hill dwarves. Who are would be the kind of dwarves you would see you would see in cosmopolitan cities selling dwarven crafts. Um. Yep, they're the ones who like to rip off all the suck. I mean, uh, customers. Yeah. <laughs> nice save. <clears throat> Um, I don't know what you're talking about. So they're pers- they're proficient in either persuasion or deception. Um, proficient either proficient in the animal handling skill or proficient with land vehicles. Proficient in survival. Whenever you make a wisdom survival check, you double your proficiency bonus. Um, community community magic. You know the friends can't trip. At third level, you can cast Charms Person. At fifth level, you can cast Suggestion. And Charisma is your spellcasting ability for both. So Hill Dwarves are literally Diplomancers. And once again, we have we have a background that is kind of signposting what classes this be- is best for. This is I um I see Hill I see a whole lot of Hill Dwarf bards in the future with this. Through that, I'd make a hill dwarf artificer and then use the friend spell to make you buy my faulty wares. <laughs> no refunds. And then, of course, we have the we have the race that I hate: elves. So let's see. let's let's bounce around a little bit more for this one because you're going to be here a long time <laughs> if you just read out each feature. Yeah. And um, plus, I'd like to actually get to, uh, but we we could probably talk about this one yeah. a little bit more. Well, yeah. they have all the normal elf stuff that you that you would see in base. Yeah. Let's see, as so far we as... can we can walk right over that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gifts. We have preternatural awareness, which having proficiency in perception is fine, and also a wisdom bonus to initiative. And can't be surprised. Uh, Mystic rapport for those who want to be able to see with. To wait, wait, wait a minute. So you're saying that that one of the gifts is uh, again basically improved initiative as a. Hmm, that's nice. Yeah. Thanks. They, everything they, everything other people have, the elves seem to have better. Let's see, Mystic rapport. Except in this instance, they don't, because it's just the similar one that uh, other gifts gain. See, Mystic Rapport, Proficiency in Arcana, and a limited te- limited telepathy. Although the although the target can't respond ba- can't respond back, they can understand as long as you share a language. That's pretty interesting. I appreciate that they didn't just chop up a spell. And say you get this spell, but only in this way, and and we take out... You get to cast a spell, except you don't get to do X, Y, and Z. I like that they actually just mentioned, like, hey, you can basically uh, sign telepathically to this other person. Mm-hmm. Um, prescient, prescient vision. I have the, just one sentence for this. I can see into the future! God damn it! <laughs> Let's see. And a... A very a variant, um, where that which they can get in addition to their other gift, blessing of the firstborn. Whenever you complete a long rest, you can change your sex. Um. Okay. <laughs> I um. I think I'm gonna move on. Uh, also, no, no, I do. Ha- I do have to mention the other half of that. <laughs> if you're pregnant and you switch sex, you can keep your pregnancy while changing your outward sex. Any comments about any of these, sir? I am moving right. I'm moving right into paragons. <laughs> With uh. blessing of the firstborn, my only question is why. <laughs> 
Let's see. Hang on to the paragons. Yes. Elf, elf sight. Your attack rolls ignore half cover, and an area be, being lightly obscured does not impose disadvantage on ability checks. So for the for those want to do for those want to go full legolas, I can see that being used. Oh, um, and also remember, you don't take disadvantage for range attacks at long range. Mm -hmm. um, inexorable dark vision, infinite dark vision. Holy shit! That's broken. <laughs> That's legit broken. There is no range Ooh. limit for your dark vision if you choose this at 10th level. Oh, I like I have that. To stand... That's pretty good I... for a Paragon gift. That is a that's a really good Paragon gift. I have to stand watch tonight. Uh, what's tonight? It's it's as bright as daylight out here, guys. I don't know what you're talking about. Did it sunset? Let's not forget that they can do the whole trance thing. Mm-hmm. That's perfect. Yep. And, go watcher. Mm -hmm. and spiritual awareness. You're under a constant detect thoughts effect. You do not need to concentrate on this effect. This effect can be dispelled with dispel magic, but it returns after you complete a short or long rest. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, so elf sight is is kind of meh. Like elf sight, eh, yeah, this is pretty elfy. But the ability to see infinitely in darkness. Or the ability to literally detect thoughts at all times, which means you you nobody can sneak up on you at that point unless it's, it's a, a construct. detect thoughts spell. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an effect. It's the effect, and it can be dispelled by dispel magic. But just no. Well, what, what I'm saying is, it is the spell. It is not the ability to, in common parlance, oh, detect anybody's thoughts. Mm -hmm. It is the spell. It has something yeah. limiting feature. Um. Well, at the very least, you can probably use it if you if you need to conduct an interrogation. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and that's extremely useful for that purpose. Yep. Let's see. Then we have elf cultures versus wood elf, which, yeah, hippies, um, proficient with long bows and longs and short swords. Let's see, plus five walking speed, climbing speed equal to their walking speed. That what you'd expect. Um, proficient with either animal handling and land vehicles or nature and herbalism kits. That was a pretty interesting spread. I enjoyed that. Let's see. You can ch you choose either animal friendship or goodberry. You know that spell and can you and can cast it once between long rests. Um, I can see animal. I it's been a while. So I'd have to look up the effects of goodberry because I don't see that spell getting used often. Actually, see that skill you that spell used a lot, to be honest, <clears throat> because it replaces the need for any sort of trail rations. Mm -hmm. Let's see, high elves, so assholes. Let's see, magical versatility. You know one extra cantrip from the wizard spell list or from a spell list of a class in which you have levels. Cunning diplomat. When you make a deception, insight, or intimi intimidation or persuasion check. You can always opt to make that skill check using intelligence. I like that. Um, proficiency with rapiers and longswords. And you have you're proficient with one free skill. Let's see, shadow elves, also also known as dark elves or drow, also also known as Clive Barker's favorite elves. <laughs> Let's see. They have shadow lore, so they can either they either know minor illusion or dancing lights. Fa they can learn. They get fairy fire at third level and darkness at fifth level. What do you think about including these guys as core? Um. Honestly, given the given the fact that that um. Uh, <clears throat> Well, what what do you what do you, what do you mean by what do you mean by that question? What do you think about including dark elves as being core? Like, what do you think? Are there any implications that you think of where it's like, mm, um, I don't know about this one. Do you think that these are, for instance, sufficiently distinct from what might be the history of Drow that they're a fitting option? I ha I was I've never been a I've never been opposed to it. 
I only I only really see that I only really see that level of opposition from the grog end of things. And um on, and honestly, this is this is one of those cases where I think I think the fact that they're referring to them as shadow elves in this means that there means that they can there's enough wiggle room to divorce themselves from saying these guys are these guys are only drow if you want them to be. Um but I've ne I've never had I've never had the only time I've ever really had an issue with um with dark with dark elves or some equivalent being core is um is when is when someone's going straight forgotten realms where they have their own history but if you're going if you're go if you're go it's one of those cases where the whole um either shit or get off the pot when it comes to D and D's idea of a setting rears its ugly head. Is like, are you are you trying to go for a default setting? In which case, I in which case I would certainly be opposed to a point. But if not, if not, not really. And this this uh this entire pl uh, level up play test seems to be setting divorce. So that's actually a, a boon in its favor. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Doesn't have a spe isn't attached to any of the specific settings that are out there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's why. Settings divorce. Setting divorced. I know some well, people no, have because a there are implied settings. Yeah. is a major facet, especially of the early games that were developed, AD and D and Traveler. Um, there are features of the mechanics which say quite a bit about what it is that you're going to be doing in the world. I don't think it's fair to bring Traveler in into this. World. I don't think it's what? fair to bring. I don't think it's fair to bring Traveler into this. Traveler mm -hmm. went to a lot went to a lot greater lengths to establish its setting. <laughs> Um, but when it came, when it came to, when it, but I've, I've gone through a lot, I've gone through a lot of, er, a lot of early, my fair share of early D and D and it's even, even back then there's still that there's, I still had a very half in half out vibe when it came to the implied setting. If you're not, when you're, when you're just looking at the core books, not looking at any of the, um, se any of the setting books. Yeah, if you're not looking at Greyhawk or whatever. Yeah. Cuz once once you do that once you do that, okay, fine. But when, but um the, but that's the reason why why I had the uh, why I've had the whole um you got you got to pick one attitude. Um between one or or not necessarily between I suppose it's multiple choice, but um, between what Cho Cho either choose an established setting or ch or choose your own setting I or, guess cho the or choose question. or choose to be more either go either go either go with either go with enough wig with enough wiggle room to say the these are th these are a series of puzzle pieces to bi to build around or pick or pick something specific you and, can't and do both yeah this one has gone puzzle pieces this is the approach that we're seeing so far mm-hmm Thirteenth Age has kind of has a kind of has a similar approach where they're they're um the there's there's they certainly have a default setting, but that but they but it goes but it um takes care to not go extremely spe specific with its default setting. Mm -hmm. Like the thirteen icons in that game aren't even named, which, as far as I'm aware, was by design. Yeah. Any, anyway, um, Eldarin, uh, which El Eladrin, yeah, El Eladrin, sorry, which um, I think they, I think they were teased in third edition, but my, my um, experience with them started with fourth, fourth, and if I, if I recall correctly, um, Ash, didn't you play an Eldarin when I did that four E campaign? I did. Yes, with a <laughs> with a pet displacer beast. Mm -hmm. Various. I enjoyed the, the details about mm -hmm. the fae in there. Yeah. Um, they are the fairiest of the fairies. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And they have tw they have twilight step, so you can f you can skip movement to teleport thirty feet in in unoccupied space. You can use this once between rests. Um. 
Although, although I do, I do recall that I was, a, I was a little bit more liberal on how often you could teleport outside of combat. I recall that as well. Um, see, knowledge of the fairy courts. You're proficient in either arcana, history, deception, survival, persuasion, or insight. Interesting. Let's see, weapon training, proficient with long swords and rapiers. Fey sublimation. You count. You count as having the fey creature type. Invocation of the Eldarin lords. You know a cantrip from one of the following list, based on the aspect of nature you wish to manifest, or that of your liege lord. I don't remember this being in core. This isn't. I like this, since it actually a... brings a bit more fey into well the fey. I like the fact that there are aspects that you wouldn't normally associate with the Fae. Mm -hmm. Like, toxicity. Like, I understand rot being in there. Because you generally think of the Fae as being parts of the unseen aspects of nature, or the more uh, esoteric aspects of nature, such as, as we see here, the four aspects of the seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, toxicity is the only one that stands out to me as kind of an outlier, to be honest. Well, it's a social element as well as an element of nature. I think it fits. I could see it. I could see it reflecting some of the more poisonous, uh, a reflection of some of the more poisonous aspects within um, plant and animal life. It's like, hey, this is your green hag, mm -hmm. if you wish to be such a thing. Yeah. 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 I, it just. I don't know, it kind of strikes me as a bit of an outlier because uh, I feel like that, that could have just as easily gone to rot, I guess is the best way to put it. No, rot with chill touch appears to be, that appears to be things yeah. which are dying and dead. Yeah. These are things which are evaporating from the world in a somewhat disgusting fashion, depending on how you there look is. at it. When you consider, when you consider the kind of natural... To I look at toxicity as again a reflection of the natural, um, po natural poisonous or to or toxic elements you might see in plant and a plant and animal life. Um, whether it whether it be whether it be from say a scorpion or or from or from plants you're not supposed to eat, or even from something as benign as say as a as a touching a thing of poison ivy. Especially since the spell that the toxicity aspect grants is poison spray. Yeah. You know, there's one re really beautiful element to toxicity, and you know what that is? What? Foxglove. <laughs> Don't you love digitalis poisoning and stopping people's hearts? <laughs> see, and... um. I hope they get a chance to expand to expand on this because it also says your selected aspect also imparts minor changes of your choice to your appearance, such as to your hair, to your eye and hair color, skin tone, or even the color of your clothing. And you, and as part of a long rest, you can change your cantrip. Long rest, to, long rest to change your aspect. You know, I've been winter for too long. Let's make this spring these days, guys. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's actually a little bit, a little bit of fun there. Yeah. Let's see no. now, this is the second. I th is this the second or third? I believe it's at least the second sub aspect mm -hmm. where people are able to add a type in addition to their type as humanoid. We had it yeah. earlier with dragons and the draconic type, and now we have it here with fey and the fey creature type. This is an aspect that I wish had remained within 5th edition. I understand it's a little bit more difficult unless you have a unless you have a, a standard of like, hey, some things are fey and some things are fey and humanoids, fey and beasts. It's a little easier to do in systems like if, if you wanted to have something in Pathfinder 2nd edition that said... Hey, we're also introducing the Fey tag in addition to this creature, which is normally a beast. That's I, I get that being a little bit more difficult to implement, but this would be this would provide a mechanical this would broaden the mechanical hooks for creature type specific effects. 
mm-hmm. because you would have more that were mixed. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. I can see that. Yep. So now with with gnomes, the batshit motherfuckers of the entire uh, universe when it comes to uh, when it comes to the stereotype, mm-hmm. completely obsessed and crazy. Yeah, every, everybody talks about whether or not Drow should be in core. I've had I've had lengthy discussions about whether or not gnomes sh- gnomes and halflings should be in core. My uh my buddy says no gnomes because too many people try to use it as a uh, as a license to uh to just act like a nass hat. Mm-hmm. He's had he's had to he's had to say no gnomes in his setting at his tables these days, which is unfortunate. He oh. likes gnomes. Let's see no. So the so as far as traits stand standard fi- standard fair I do like um the fact that they have intelligence on they have an advantage on intelligence wisdom and charisma saving throws against magic a little typo with that end with that end parenthesis thing um the two gifts that they have at their at their thing is gnomish agility plus one to armor class against creatures of medium size and larger. And if your size is not already small, your size becomes small. That's a fun little mm-hmm. element. That's oh. one of the two gifts they can choose. I think they added that other sentence in case somebody does um does the does the whole mixed thing. So yeah, yeah. mixed heritage. Yeah, you're not gnomes are small, and if you're gonna, if you're going to grow up around them, you're going to be small too. I think it's for somebody who is small. Yeah. Like if he chose this, it would be like, oh, and by the way, your character was just happened to grow up little. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, an into mist. As a bonus action or as a reaction, immediately after taking damage, you can turn invisible and teleport thirty feet to an unoccupied space you can see. It lasts until the end of your next turn and ends early if you attack, deal damage, cast a spell, or force a creature to make a saving throw. I don't see fighters taking this using this often. That sets you up for a nice Why backstab. Um, I'd s- large largely because of the f- largely because of the fact that they'd ha- that a lot of times fighters would have to stay still in order to draw in order to draw attention. I mean, I could see it being used, but I get but it's going to get used by other classes more. Oh no! When I play martial characters, I like having repositioning, particularly when the creatures the GM is throwing at me have a tendency to kite. Mm-hmm. So this is a nice means of just catching up with people. Or if you happen to be a ranged martial character, repositioning quickly away from somebody who doesn't uh, who does not want you there is is pretty useful. Reaction immediately after taking damage. That's going to be nice. Especially since you can make your next, provided that you attack during the invisibility, you get to do so with advantage. Uh, your and, if you're, and if you're a rogue, you also get your backstab bonus dice. Yep. Yeah, that's going to be fun. So, par- Paragon... They, only have, they yep. only have one. They only have one, and it's cunning reflexes. So, either strength, dexterity, or constitution, you have advantage against that... Ag- against um, magic. That seems kind of blah. Like, yeah, having an advantage on one uh, saving throw type for for magic, I'm going to choose dex because a lot of magic out there is dex for half or dex for none. Uh, <clears throat> but that still seems like it they don't might, have an additional would it, feel le- would it feel less blah if Gnome Cunning didn't already exist? I, mean, I feel like it feels less blah because Gnome Cunning exists. They're going from three saving throws to four. Well, and the... Uh, it would feel less blah if, if perhaps they had another Gnomish Paragon to make yes, it. Yeah. Yes. It, I, I, I'm, I want more choice. That's essentially what I'm saying here. Yeah. The, the, the give fact me, that give me a Gnomish Magic I, uh, option, I suppose. Yeah. I, do th- I do think that... I, if if there's another paragon fe- feature, I do think one that should be added is some something that goes on the um, on the cantrip pattern that we've seen others use. 
No, you get a cantrip at the start, then get another one at third and fifth level. Mm -hmm. I like those less. I like the. I understand what, but then again, they have an advantage insofar as they're making. Again, this is goes back to implied setting, mm -hmm. and its utility is they're making a declarative statement about like, hey, these are magical creatures, to some extent. Well, we've already crossed the magical creature threshold with some, with some of their gifts. Yes. And anyway, um, let's see as far as culture, the first we have is Deep Gnome. Um, who ha who have advantage on stealth checks went to hide in rocky terrain, 120 feet of dark vision, and well, look at that. We have the the whole spell the whole spells for five for five levels. We have that here. At first level, they get disguise self. At third level, they learn blindness slash deafness. At fifth level, they get non detection. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can only ca and you can only and you can only cast blindness. You can't cast deafness. Which went back to that earlier comment I made about how I actually usually don't like those. If you're going to give me a spell like effect with some restrictions, I generally prefer you just give me a a uniquely tuned effect, mm -hmm. which could potentially add in. You know, uh, take the Firavin in Lords of Brackets and the. I suppose, yeah, you know, they're cl most closely mapped to Fear Bulks in 5th edition. Yeah, well, it would have to be 5th edition based on when, when it is that they showed up earlier. Um, I wanted to have a effect where they, you know, they use the voice of their giant heritage and they could basically force the voice to linger in a given place until a set time. And something I could have done was I could have said, you cast the message, you learn the message cantrip. When you cast it, you determine when a person can is able to hear it and um, and what basically what the time limit is. You determine when it is, the what the trigger is for the person to hear it. Mm -hmm. That's a little, I don't know, I, I like that less because you have the opportunity to, it could be viewed as a time saver, but you're also cutting off the opportunity to add in a little bit of racial or ancestral or whatever specific lore and flavor that you might not, that might not be as obvious otherwise. Yep. Um, well, that's just personal taste. Yeah. See, then we have forest gnomes, which are the, which are, I'd say, I'd say is more apropos for how we, how they're often seen. They start with start with minor illusion. At third level, they get entangle, and at fifth level, they get bark skin. They also can communicate simple thoughts and ideas with small beasts. Well, not. I feel like that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And use intelligence for their illusion spells. See, then we have Tinker Gnomes, i.e. the World of Warcraft Gnomes. I.e. one of the biggest stereotyped gnomes in ex uh, gnome types in existence. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Cunning Creative. Proficient with Tinker's Tools. Can spend one hour and ten GP worth of materials to build a variety of useful tools. This is basically the, the core set of options that you have. Mm -hmm. So let's see, a Clockwork, clockwork Figure, Fire Starter... Audio phone sensor. Mm -hmm. Not too, sh not too shabby. It, I feel. Once again, we have a bit of uh, we have a bit of that class sign posting. Um, let's see, lore, and lore of creation. You're proficient in either history or arcana. When, and this proficiency is doubled when using it related to magical, alchemical, or technological items. Then we have the Forgotten Folks. With an X for some reason. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, as long as the party member is within 60 feet of you, you always know their general location. Even if you can even if you cannot see or otherwise sense them. One foot of lead or iron or a spell like non-detection prevents it from working. And 
you can use the health action as a bonus action. Interesting. And the range at which you can help an ally increases to 15 feet. And you once per long rest, when you help, you can let them add double their proficiency bonus to their roll as well as rolling with advantage. Another um, type, another skill monkey in indicator here. Yeah. Let's see, then we have halflings. Um who have two gifts. Um, burrowing Claws, which I'd say is self-explanatory, plus we have another person who has the... They have, um, three. Um, they have three gifts. Oh, yeah, three gifts. Um, tuft Feet, so for the... which I'd say is more Hobbit than the others. And Twilight Touch, which gives, the, gives them Telepathy and Dark Vision. In Halfling Culture, we have the um, Burrower. I almost read that as the Borrowers, like that old, like that old story. Mm. Um, let's see, Borrow Cooking. Home, which let's see, they, when you begin a short rest, you and up to six allies can each partake in your Borrow Cooking by consuming an amount of food equal to the normal amount of food it would take to sustain themselves. Any creature that partakes in cooking this way gains 1d6 temporary hit points. You're so satisfied you can take more damage. Oh. <laughs> I, can, I can see some... I can see that being a natural fit in the setting like the Chronicles of Ears. Um, let's see. Home, gar home gardening. Keep a side vegetable garden or a... Ch or a or the like, you're proficient in either animal handling or nature skills. Let's see, memorist. You have a habit of jotting down of events. Um, so you, you're proficient with calligrapher supplies, and you can make any wisdom check to recall details about past events by checking your journals. That must be one. Ha that must be one big ass journal. Well, it says journals. It's mm -hmm. probably, you know, half your backpack filled with books. Yep. Um, Kith Bane, Clan, Clan Shen locked. Clan locked. Clan. I am. Because it's, I am. I'm pretty sure it's Gaelic. I am terrible with Gaelic. Like, like that'd be that'd be Kith Bane. Mm -hmm. or, it, yeah, I am terrible with Gaelic. Uh, I am too, but this I, I I have to say it. I'm sorry. I see it. I have to say it. I got gotcha. you. Um, let's see. Sunlight Keep sensitivity. Fighting. They have disadvantage with attack rolls and wiz and perception checks that rely on sight when you're in direct sunlight. Wonder if the one. I'd want. I wonder how. I wonder if that would still apply if they're wearing sunglasses. Especially if they're wearing like those MIB style sunglasses. In <laughs> <laughs> um, it. Hey, it worked in Dragon Ball. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's the good best way to best way to deal with solar flare? Sunglasses. <laughs> um, superior dark vision, so you can see in dim light. Up, so you got it up to sixty feet. The Ken, you can cast detect detect thoughts once with this with this um trait. Once per short or long rest. Interesting. Um, without secrets. Proficiency with insight and can add double your proficiency bonus to checks made with it. Um, the most barn. Yep, most barn. Ooh, let's see. Child of the soil. You ignore difficult terrain caused by any form of earth or soil. And you know druid craft. Earth speak. Mm -hmm. Earth speak. Earth speak. You. Let's see. You attempt to divine the earth's wisdom as per the spell augury by submerging at least your feet or hands into mud or soil. Once you do, once you divine it, you cannot do so again until you finish a long rest. Does that qualify as, as that? It's this spell, but thing that you had mentioned previously, Ash. A no, little it, bit. 
this, just, I, this not did. really because it's more or less just like do the spell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not like a special restriction on it. It's just do the spell, but with yeah, a little uh, bit of added flavor onto it. So that's uh, that's fine. It's just changing the flavor of augury. Whereas augury says, you know, casting sticks or rolling dragon bones, laying out cards, etc. Mm -hmm. Um. And you, you, you. What in, in this case, instead of it's an otherworldly entity, you're literally asking the Earth itself about one specific course of action you plan to take within thirty minutes, and then wheel, woe, or nothing. And you make you make the role. The DM makes the role in secret. Mm -hmm. And let's see that then we have wild and unshackled. Chaotic alignment for the purposes of any spell or ability that would detect or affect chaotic creatures. I'm not a big fan of the alignment system. No. And really then, of course, it. two skill proficiencies amongst mm -hmm. acrobatics, animal handling, nature, religion, or survival. Yep. Let's see, then we have tunnel runners. Much not to be confused with tunnel snakes. Um, tunnel snakes rule. Let's see. Base walking speed is 35 feet. Oh, hey, now they're faster than most basic races. Mm -hmm. Well, there. Well, that's where they probably get the runner part. Um, let's see. You gain proficiency with either acrobatics, deception, nature, or stealth. Okay. When you're grappled, you can automatically escape that grapple as a reaction. But once only once per long rest. <laughs> Um, Ugh. I feel like when it comes to I under I think I understand why you have an issue with the with the whole once per long rest that thing that's with a lot of features. Sometimes I can sometimes I can see that working, and other times I have a, I have a harder time narratively justifying it. And this is one of those cases where I think it applies. I would I would reduce this to maybe once per encounter. Like you, you, you. Between encounters, you've you've gotten significantly twitchy enough to slip out of a grapple once in the next encounter. Mm -hmm. But because, frankly, once per long rest means you can't do it all day until you take an eight-hour rest. That's ridiculous. Plus, you're plus some um, because of the fact that you're taking a reaction to do this. You're already you already have a restriction on it. But. Having having it once per long rest, I feel like I feel like in that kind of situation, people would um, hoard it unnecessarily. You know, the whole rainy day thing that we've talked about. Yeah, they'd either hoard it unnecessarily, or they'd take a lot more long rests than usual. Well, they just go nova, and they it reduces. In fact, let's let's talk about some of these design principles here, rather than the surprise audiobook <laughs> of the document. Um. What do you guys so base most the vast I shouldn't say the vast majority certainly all of these mm -hmm. function off of either shorter long rest or long rest and my problem generally speaking with those is not necessarily narrative and not necessarily uh, even I, I guess it's technically speaking a little bit of a game balance feature because oftentimes designers will feel if they have a reason to like listen if there is a quote-unquote like this giant restriction like you can only do this once per long rest then i can make this an especially powerful ability and technically speaking you're right but that leads to degenerate play insofar as you know you have a given encounter and everybody goes nova and now the encounter is ruined and it, it just kind of like ruins the progression of play in some capacity, or I shouldn't say ruins, but it, it makes things so ridiculously swingy that even if you are designing a game in which, you know, GMs are supposed to set and balance encounters and stuff like that, it can't really do it effectively. I think I think this is I think this is the reason why a lot of people have praised the um, escalation die in the way it the way it's used in the sense that it it kind of it kind of bottlenecks the opportunity to um, Nova. Um, I'd say yeah. I'd say th I'd say the whole shorter long rest. This probably, if if you were if this was using a if this was using a um set a setup where you had 
Or you had multiple, you had mul you had multiple resources that that could be dr that could be drawn upon. Whether that happens to be like some sort of AP system, or so, or so, or um, or the A or even the AEDU thing that for that four E has, there would be more options to restrict. And for me personally, if something's long rest, then it should be there should there should be more of there should be more of an effect. And in the case of something like slippery, the only way I could see that working is is instead of it just being a get out of grapple free that you get to use once per eight hours, have it that okay af after this you cannot you cannot be grappled again during the rest of this during the rest of this encounter, and you're not getting it back until you get that eight hour rest. Like that. Right. Might and be what I'm saying is, I like just don't do any long rest restrictions and things of that sort. One of the newer in Tasha's, one of the newer methods, one of the new descriptions and sort of collection of keywords for resource management is you get to do this once per short or long rest, or, or you can do this once per short or long rest. If you want to use it again before that, you have to expend whatever, in this case, it's not necessarily a class resource. It's more like whatever the particular subclass resource is, if you would like to produce that effect again. And I think what that does is it forces the designer to mediate the generalized effects of the of this thing. And maybe they're not as far reaching or as grand in scale, one of the two. But the player has an opportunity to do it in rapid succession if they want to and keep themselves from doing it at some other opportunity. I guess what I'm saying is I'm not interested in the abilities that a designer comes up with that a person can only use them once per long rest, because either they are going to be so grand and so great in scale that they th completely throw off the progression and, and sort of style of play, or they're going to be underwhelming and not worth it for a, or, or maybe not necessarily not worth taking whatever that particular character option that, that is provided but certainly makes you feel as if you didn't really get anything. It's like, really, this is my once per long rest, and somebody else gets their big long, once per long rest. It's, it feeds into arm race design, and I despise that. I, I have no I patience gotcha. for it in the year of the Lord twenty twenty one. I gotcha. The only um, the only reason I'd be hesitant to go with the approach that Tasha is going with is the is the fact that there's the fact that not every class has that um, secondary resource. Right, but if you're designing a game from the ground up mm -hmm. and saying from the default, like, any designer that contributes something, I do not want to see once per long rest come across my desk. Desk, It will be, at most, once per short rest, but perhaps better. Um, you know, you could do this once per short or long rest or by expending X resource once again. I do, rem I do remember... Find I do remember finding some old notes that I had, but unfortunately never finished. And for that I did that I wrote for when I was um when I was when I was still working with um AD and D second, where I ha I had what I what I at the time I called feats, and no, it's not anything like the feats that you that you'd see. It was more of a um it was it was a set of resources based on your um. Abil based on a given ability modifier, you know. So if your if your strength had a was it had a plus five modifier, you had f you had five feet charges. And what I had done is for certain for certain effects, I would instead of writing it as you you get this x number of times per day, I'd write it as okay. If you want to if you want to use this, you sp you spend you spend say a strength. This counts as a strength feat. And yeah, and you see that in you see that in some of the newer options for fifth edition, certainly, where it'll tell you like this this number per your modifier, or this number per your proficiency bonus. And I would I'd I'd be a little more I'd be a little more fine with that with that approach. Um, I think the only difference is that is the setup I had at the time. The um, charges were shared, so it wasn't it wasn't like you could go all in with it, but you could still have a little bit of wiggle room with it. Mm. Um, 
let's see. Is then we have humans, the gifts that they <laughs> that they gave. You know, it is Die Hard Survivor. You, you um, skipped. You skipped trained filter for the. Uh... Oh yeah, sorry. Trained filter. You're proficient in sleight of hand, and whenever you'd make a sleight of hand check, um, you can make that check with advantage five. Um, that's what. I'm presuming that is a bonus that you gain whenever you gain the advantage. You know, whenever somebody gives you the marker of advantage. That's what I. That's what I'd assume. But we're. <laughs> but we're. But didn't didn't five of you want to get away from the whole plus two minus two with advantage and disadvantage as the replacement? But um, this is the play test. I I, I feel I like there might that, be some mixed nomenclature terminology here. I'm thinking it could that's be a that. typo. <laughs> Just that's make the check with advantage with no with no five there. Yeah. Except a space. Yeah, and somebody a five. just typed it out of habit. <laughs> <laughs> not paying attention. I can see that. Okay. Yeah. No, no, I, I don't think it was a typo. I think if that is the case that this iteration of the playtest didn't feature that, somebody just carried it over from 4th edition or 4th or third edition, whichever. Honestly, I could see the whole Advantage 5 thing. I could see that in Shadow of the Demon Lord, but not, not this. So, I'd like to point out that there's a... I, can, can you remind me, was the Intrepid Trait Core for Humans... Let's find where the... where is it? Intrepid? Yeah. What is he? Oh, there it is. It's above human gifts. You can Even declare your survival advantage. instinct is remarkably strong. Blah blah blah. You could declare that you have advantage on that role. No, it is not core. I did not think so. I was like, okay, so there's an addition in the base human traits that isn't core. I think that's the first edition that isn't core that we've seen since the Dragonborn. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's see. So then we have we have Di Die Hard Sur Die Hard Survivor, Spirited Traveler, and Ingenious Focus as gifts. The first one is is def is definitely themed or is definitely themed around the whole um, survivor part. Spirit Mad Max. <laughs> Um, here's a bit of a weird typo with this whole will go far in a different font. <laughs> yeah, by the way, you know how, how there was that, that, that dwarf that could survive for six days plus con mod? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, this gift, the diehard survivor, double your con score for how many days you can go without eating. You know, at high levels, it's only a matter of time until someone get it until someone has at least one ability score at twenty. Mm -hmm. So the idea, so that means that a diehard survivor could go forty days without eating. Yeah, which is what you would expect out of a high level character. Mm -hmm. Well, and then of course, radical perseverance. You have proficiency bonus added to your scores on death saves. And, That's uh, uh, pretty cool. Yeah, a nat one still results in two negatives. A nat twenty still pulls you directly into stabilized. And a result of twenty one or higher. So let's say you you're you have your normal proficiency bonus of plus two at the beginning, and you roll a, a nineteen. It's also treated as a twenty. I would like to definitely like to know. I I am reading this as it is being treated as a natural twenty, as the same results as a, of of a twenty. I would I would because I they would, haven't distinguished I I guess they did distinguish that they did but I would assume that if it's treated as a 20 if it gets higher than 20 it's treated as a 20 would still mean you're automatically pulled to 1 HP yeah because why would because otherwise they could just say a result of 21 or higher is treated as, as a success or they wouldn't even need to they wouldn't even need to go need that to mention far. it yeah yeah a, so I'm I'm gonna assume that that means it treated as a natural 20 yeah Let's see. Mar Marath then we have Marathon Runner, which is all all about those who want to well do Mar do <laughs> with Spirithon, Spirited Traveler. It's part of the Spirited Traveler, isn't it? Yeah, and I look at Spirited Traveler, and all I can think of is why do I hear Chariots of Fire playing? I look at Spirited Traveler and go, when did I last keep track of 
actual travel times unless it was a timed objective? I'll keep... Tr well, back here, they were actually thinking of making exploration an actual feature of the game, clearly. Mm -hmm. Which, yes. good on them. Yes, I'm just... My brain is going, when was the last time I kept track of travel times? Oh yeah, when I needed to attack them in the middle of the night, because it was fun. Here you go, guys. Have fun. Let's see. And Ingenious Focus, which has Resident Expert and Inexorable Concentration. Resident Extra, you get two tools in which you're proficient, or a skill in which you're proficient from Animal Handling, Arcana, History, Investigation, Medicine, Nature, or Religion. When the and I actually find this a bit more interesting than some of the other modifications to advantage rolls. If it you don't get it, oh yeah. If Go the ahead. d twenty shows a natural result of two through seven, you count it as being an eight. It's basically, which is a bit of weird language. Basically, setting the the floor for that particular skill as being eight. Mm -hmm. For anybody who doesn't have it in front of them, which speaking of which, we could probably skip a bunch of these. But this is. Very much leaning into, I mean, they come right out and say it in Spirited Traveler. The power of movement is one of humanity's evolutionary advantages. I had this discussion on my Discord server with a fellow named Zaphos, and what they said was, like, I would like to see features which lean into the fact that humans are something of a unique animal in specific, not even cognitive regards, but physical regards. We have sweat glands that are close to our skin, and we can we can just run for insane periods of time, whereas other prey animals are focused on just running, or even predator animals focused on running for very, very short bursts of speed, whereas the human could just track you down and they could just keep a jogging pace for hours upon hours upon hours. Mm -hmm. Exhaustion, predation, what we did for exactly. most of early humanity. I think these are very clever. This is this is more one this is not only just implied setting content, but this is going a step further and saying, hey, humans in real life and, and in this particular game especially are really fascinating, really cool. They're creatures with access to abilities and endurances that other creatures, even other humanoid creatures, wouldn't have access to. Are you saying that you that you'd rather you'd that um you and this per and this person on the uh, Discord want to move away from the concept of um human if you're about to give me a reference traits. i'm going to bite my own head off no i wasn't no i wasn't i was sim i was simply going to say there's there's a bit there's a bit of a prevalence to have humans as the jack of all trades race where their racial yeah, it's, feature it's is extraordinarily oh. frustrating um i think the only the only time i, I can think of where i've see where i've seen that really delved further delved further in was the um, was the human talent feature that's in fantasy craft? Um, of and gra granted, yeah, games it's usually like just boring. It's like, hey, if humans are in, humans are already cool. Humans are already cool. There's... And if you're going to introduce them to a fantasy world, start making use of that. Like, if your world has psionics in it. Well, there are plenty of people in real life who are NPCs, and then we're going to make a statistic for that. Like, hey, you're part of an egregore, and now you don't have to worry about concentration checks or something like that. Something silly. Well, and of course, humanity being exemplary at something is what the humanity fuck yeah threads that have been going across the internet for years now are all about. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's not like there's any shortage of fodder for mundane features that humans would get to specialize in. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is there's really no excuse for it. And I am so happy to see in this play... God, there's so much good material on this play test. Yeah. See, even, yeah. even if a lot of it is sort of like first draft assumptions and mm -hmm. stuff like that, which sadly made it through to 5th edition, uh, good on the people who wrote this stuff. Because yeah. it's, it's fascinating. And I'm sorry that your work was not treated... As it should have been. Yeah. So we have de their paragons are determined, or you can use a bonus action to give yourself a plus five bonus to a check. But only at half your hit points or fewer. Yeah, when you're bloodied. Mm -hmm. 
But then, of course, it comes again with the same fucking restriction of short or long rest. Yep. Um, evasive, a evasive action. Which plays into our humans being exhaustion predators thing. <laughs> Your walking yeah. speed goes up by 10 feet. You ignore difficult terrain on dash. And you don't uh, provoke AOO from creatures you attack with melee weapons. Unt until the end of your turn, mm -hmm. e even if you hit or miss. Yep. And voracious <clears throat> learner, choose three options from the list. A language, a skill proficiency, or a tool proficiency. You can choose each option multiple times. So you could choose three different skill proficiencies, or two skill proficiencies as a tool, or, or and a tool, or three languages. Any combination of the three that you'd like. Mm-hmm. See, then we have cult human cultures. Um, How are uh, they going to condense human cultures into something? <laughs> let's see. We have profiteer for the merchant mancers. Fun. Fine print. <laughs> Whenever you draft up a written agreement, you can attempt to obfuscate the meaning using confusing and dense terminology by making. So what we're. <laughs> <laughs> what we're talking about here now is you you gain legalese. That's that's all you have to say. You gain legalese. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, wonder if the wonder if we could wonder if we could jigger this to make it to um to make it have a, a techno babble like like effect. It has to be written, but yes, you could. If you're chief engineer on the starship and you write up a technical draft of something. <laughs> Um, and you, you know, just make it so that rather than a written agreement, it's a technical draft. Mm -hmm. The only way that anybody can make a roll against you is if they thoroughly read it. So, but I, I reverse the polarity of uh, I reverse the polarity of the tachyon beam. <laughs> Let's see. Well, it's not it's not pseudo babble if you don't have reversed polarities and tachyon beams. <sighs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> let's see. Man anyway, mantle of authority. Um let's see. So you not have... only can do you have legal ease, you have narcissism. No, you have you have advantage on persuasion checks when dealing with guards, soldiers, and other figures of authority. Only because you're confident that you are right to be wherever you are. This is this is legal ease and narcissism to the point of delusions of grandeur. Got it. <laughs> Let's see. Merchandise, familiarity, any intelligence checks you make to appraise the worth of an item are at advantage. Trade route experience. You are proficient with tar cartographer and navigator's tools and can double your proficiency to checks made with them. This, is, a, this is the confidence man. This is the fucking... No. No, no, it's worse than a con man. It's Christopher fucking Columbus. <laughs> he was, he, he thought he had, he had reached India and he convinced Europe he had reached India. <laughs> it's fucking Chris Columbus. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, sheltered citizen is the, is the other one. Also known as a Tumblr user. Or also known as any normal member of the Imperium. Mm. Let's see. Cent central schooling. Proficiency in two skills. Medical retinue. Whenever your hit point maximum or one of your ability scores would be reduced, it is instead reduced by half that. Misplaced optimism. <laughs> You're immune to frightened from sources that haven't dealt damage to you. I oh, even like if it's a... Even if, if even if you get hit by dragon fear, so long as the dragon has not hurt you, you're immune. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> That's how that reads. You can't be feared by something that has yet to actually deal damage. Thus, if a dragon uses its fear, but hasn't dealt you damage, you're fucking immune. I love this. I don't know why they made humans the, the grab bag of hilarity, but I love it. <laughs> see, then we have villager. Um, let's see, farm life, proficient in animal handling, about what you'd expect. Sharpened tools. Provised weapon proficiency. I can see that getting abused. Tall tales. 
can use Wisdom modifier when making History, Nature, or Religion checks. However, at your GM's discretion, the results of checks made in this way may be distorted or exaggerated forms of the truth. Folklore, literally. Yep. Let's see, Vill Village Watch, you have advantage on Perception chest checks made while keeping watch during arrest. Nice. Um, and we have Pioneer... Claim Staker. When you begin a long rest, you can choose to spend the first hour fortifying that position, where the ground in a 60-foot radius around you is considered difficult terrain for any characters other than those you consider allies. Whenever a hidden creature enters the fortified area for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there, it must make a dex saving throw with a DC equal to 8 plus whiz plus proficiency bonus. On a failed save, they inadvertently make loud noises and are no longer hidden. So, um, I am fortifying this position. You're Rogel Dorn. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Let's see, Frontier, Sur Frontier Survival, proficient with Insight and Survival. Self-explanatory. Strange Forager. You have advantage on any check to determine if something is poisonous. I can take that many ways. <laughs> Then we ha um, I feel like somebody had too much fun writing the writing the humans in this. Especially the, especially the sheltered citizen and the profiteer. I'm sorry, <laughs> those two are hilarious, and it is very clear that there was just the, they they were thinking of some specific character with one of those. They had to be. Yeah. I'm surprised that we have orc and not half orc. That's always been the tradition. Not that I'm complaining. Well, remember, mixed heritages are their own thing. Yeah. So you have your full orc heritage. Mm -hmm. Which looks like... Let's everything see. that's normal and core for their traits? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Gifts are tough-blooded. So when so essentially second chance, and of course you know unarmored. Yep. Um. See, I think we. Let me skip over to two tiefling because it goes with orcs. I think I think we understand where things are going. Um, because I wanted to see this. <laughs> Gifts: archdevil blooded, cursed, cambion blooded. And so celestial blooded. So you're di you're up. Oh, you're fucking Dante. <laughs> no, not uh, not Dante. You're um. Well, you're a Nephilim. Um. Although the idea the idea of a steam tiefling is an interesting concept, then um, general cultures, um, and then mm -hmm. backgrounds. Yep. Think we should save these for another episode? Um, the because the, I would like to get back to orcs. I think there's some <laughs> fascinating stuff in there. The I'd like to I'd like to make them actual design discussions. Yeah. Um, I think we. Can, the thing that I see with backgrounds, because the for the format seems to go plus one to two attributes, proficiency in two skills, um, proficiency in two tools, two languages, or one of each, one connection, one memento, and a background feature. It seems to be, the backgrounds seem to be largely similar to how they've been in the past, just shifting over the um, ability the um, ability score modifier. I know they wrote out attributes, but again, old habits. But the ones that they have are acolyte, charlatan, criminal, entertainer, folk hero, um, guild artisan, hermit, noble, outlander, sage, sailor, soldier, and urchin. Which I think that's more or less the same list of backgrounds that's in core. Yeah, I think there was only maybe one in there that I 
Mm-hmm. Don't know if I've seen in core before. Yeah. But over overall, when it comes to this whole origin thing, I'll go I'll go first in the sense that I there are things that I there are things that I like in this and there are things that I don't like. I think we've made it clear that the thing we don't like is the whole you can use this ability once per short rest or once per long rest or once per both kind of thing. Like I, mm-hmm. I get the fact that I get the fact that they're that they're um, restrained in the confines of the of core, but at this at the same time, I feel I feel like there's some missed opportunities here. Well, it's a playtest, and we're seeing where they you know the, how concepts began forming forming themselves into mechanical language, and unfortunately, they took a they took a, a set which may have been... I'm not sure if they could have seen this, these particular mechanics being as problematic and, and frustrating as they are in the modern day. I don't know if they actually could have seen ahead of that. It was simply a matter of which, which concept, which mechanical language was developed out of the restrictive concept first. Mm-hmm. And it just happened to be the one that was... Or maybe not the one, but a one which was frustrating and overly restrictive. Yeah, that that said, I will admit, as an overall package, I like where this kind of thing is going. Um, you know, give, giving a giving a lot more expansion to to um to what was race in core, and because of that, you ha- because of that, you have a lot of opportunities to. To you, to use it, to use it in ways that are, that are going to be leaning more in role playing. Even even if the um, co- even if the subject matter d- doesn't necessarily build for it, for lack of a better for lack of a better phrasing. We should definitely go back. We should definitely do another one of these where we go over the backgrounds and go over um, the general cultures. When it comes. Um, Is there specifics in here that I think need to be addressed? And for for a point that we might not necessarily have time for at the moment. When it com- when it comes to th- when it comes to them, I'll s- I'll certain we can certainly do that as a bit of a ke- as a bit of a catch up next week. But um, what I've got pl- the one that I've got planned for next week is where we'll start looking into a few of the uh, cl- a few of the classes that they have in mind. Starting with my fa- my favorite punching bag, or rather my favorite. My favorite class that ends up being a punching bag for bad designers, fighters. Hmm. So, All right, so that that's what we'll have that's what we'll have planned for next week. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>